Okay, so uh, uh, it's a big pleasure to have here today uh, Sarah Hooker from Career for AI. Uh, so Sarah leads uh, Career for AI. This is a, a organization inside Cohere. Um, and uh, Sarah has a lot of work in uh, efficient uh, neural networks. Uh, there is a very nice work uh, with the Ardor Lottery uh, that you should all read. Uh, and today, uh, so before that, she was in Google Brain, so, you know, very long career. Uh, and today she's going to talk about understanding the role of data scale and capacity in recent breakthroughs. So thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so it's so lovely to be here. This is the talk in the evening, so I actually think we should make it fun. So I have a bunch of things, but I also think it would be nice if we feel free to throw out questions. So even if there's not a mic, uh, maybe try and project, but we'll keep it open. We may not get to all the slides, but I thought what might be interesting was to kind of give a perspective of where we are with some of the recent breakthroughs and maybe some of the things that I'm grumpy about. So. I think that's always fun. Um, and maybe some samples of questions that I think are fun to work on right now. So um, my uh, title is loosely called Understanding the Role of Data Scale and Capacity in Recent Breakthroughs. And Andrea gave such a fantastic introduction. I think that, oh, there we go. Yeah, I don't think I have much more to say here. I lead Cohere for AI, so it's a research lab. We're actually a hybrid lab. We have a full-time research staff, but we also have an open science initiative. So a lot of what we do is collaborate across universities, but drive fundamental research. So, um, and Andre also said very, you know, captured really well a lot of the research agenda. So I've been interested for a while in just how do we train models to fulfill multiple criteria, efficiency being one of them but also things like understanding um, algorithm hardware dependencies, robustness in general, like how do we create models which are not brittle? So there's this really interesting question there. Um, and I currently work on designing large scale language models that are efficient, multilingual, reliable, and trustworthy. So if you're interested in any of these areas, I'm happy to chat after the talk as well. But what are we doing today? Start. So uh, we have this little research model that um, feel free to text if you get bored um, But the, <laughs> during this talk. But I said, I'm giving a talk about large language models. What are five things that makes it exciting? And what came back, these five reasons. So large language models can help us understand the world. They can be used to generate content. So you may have noticed this is a lot of why it's a very exciting time to do this research. These are very fluid responses um, uh, to a general question. Uh, and for many people, this is what excited them about a lot of recent research is that it, in some ways we're getting fluid responses which feel um, conversational and in some ways kind of evoke what we find so, much, so powerful about language, this ability to communicate and connect. Um, What's interesting, oh, and I did, um, so I have two days here, as Andrea reminded me, so I asked, what should I do uh, in Lisbon? So take a walk through the Baisha neighborhood, go to a photo show, so maybe we'll try and squeeze that in tonight <laughs> before I leave. But um, again, this is why it's so exciting to think about this time. But while it's all exciting, it's actually probably more interesting to understand how we got here. So, you know, why, you know, what led to this moment? Because it's often a series of cumulative choices. Um, I want to introduce you to Eliza. So who knows Eliza? Oh, go for it, Noah. Nice. Got it up quick. Um, OK, so what is Eliza? Someone who, who knows of it. I saw some hands in the middle there. What's Eliza? Be brave. Oh, excellent. That captured a lot. Okay, it's a rule-based chatbot that people got very intimate with. <laughs> we'll get to that point, what, what we mean by intimate with. Okay, so this is good. So Eliza was based on this form of therapy called Rogerian therapy that involved a very powerful technique of repeating back to the patient what they said. So for example, uh, to the gentleman in the third row, I might say, how was your date today? Oh, and how does that make you feel? How does that make you feel? <laughs> so a little bit of an awkward exchange, but people found it very convincing at the time. This was kind of considered revolutionary. 
So for example, uh, if I try to uh, ask the same question that I asked at the beginning, so I'm giving a talk about large language models, what should I do? Um, if I say that, Eliza will say back, is it that you would like to be able to give you five reasons large language models, I'm exciting, and then I say yes, and then Eliza will say, I see, let's explore that a bit more. So you can kind of see where this rule-based model falls off a cliff in performance and where you start to see the limitations and really, it was a set of rule-based logic. So you, you would say, if Eliza couldn't identify a keyword or phrase, you would use a stock phrase, such as, please go on, or let's explore that more. However, and now we get to the intimate part, this was very persuasive for many users at the time, so much so that um, really uh, there was a grumpy <laughs> uh, publication from uh, Dr. Joseph because he even found his uh, secretary using it to confide uh, secrets about like her boyfriend and querying Eliza and so this resulted in this fantastic grumpy book which I think we may need to bring back into circulation which is why these are statistical systems and maybe we shouldn't uh, kind of associate human-like characteristics with them but in some ways it's a uh, very interesting to think about because it's evocative of some of the themes that we're seeing now. So here's the question that I pose today. How did we get from uh, Eliza to where we are today? What were the key ingredients? Who wants to throw one out? Oh, GPUs, excellent. Yes, GPUs will come up. Yes, um, we'll talk about that. What else? Data, okay, excellent. So we have those two. So Transformers, deep learning, okay, yep, we've almost, we've almost got the full bingo card, what else? <laughs> uh, yes, okay, so we're going to talk about that as well. Okay, fun, so this is great, this is like, you know how they have the talk with the bullet points where we're going to go? Let's go. Okay, so um, in fact, I think early computer science history, the first thing that's interesting is that we're in a very, computer science history is short, I think this is what's so fascinating, but for most of computer, modern computer science history has been very divided. What is the approach to modeling? Eliza was, as the gentleman said, this example of a rule-based approach. Um, and these were two camps. So you have connectionist, deep neural network uh, camp, which believed that you could learn features. And then you have this rule-based expert systems, which were actually very effective for certain narrow tasks. So could very persuasively navigate narrow search spaces. Um, like even chess being or checkers, um, but fell apart when we couldn't codify all the information. And this is interesting because um, it's also an example of what I would call incentive structures. So for a long time, this was a marginalized community and deep neural networks and the people who worked on them. And in fact, there were very few places where you could work on this. And this is where we see incentive structures like funding play a huge role. Canada is like one of the few places that continue to fund deep neural networks. And uh, I think it's reflected in the fact that a lot of the experts, um, when it was widely adopted, uh, came from the few schools in Canada. Uh, and um, what's interesting is that this continued through 2012. So someone mentioned, uh, uh, someone with small breaks along the way. I think a lot of it uh, was very, uh, was able to, to show partial success at small scale, but nothing that was empirically successful on understood benchmarks. So what changed things? Someone mentioned GPU. Um, I think that's actually a very timely uh, factor. The other factor was data, but I, I think that in hindsight, we now know that 2012 was the moment when people automatically switched overnight because um, on standard you know, benchmarks, like the ImageNet challenge, deep neural networks blew everything else out of the water. So it was such an impressive production error rate that it was almost like everyone jumped overnight to adopt adopting deep neural networks. Um, and this was, uh, you know, and Andre mentioned my paper, The Harvard Laurie. I think this is, I like thinking about these things because I think in some ways this was lucky. So some parts were intentional, like Pepe Lee building out this impressive ImageNet data set, but GPUs were never destined for machine learning. In fact, uh, a lot of the work over the early 2000s before this for fruit was the slow repurposing of GPUs so it could carry a machine learning work workload. And it was done in very isolated ways across different labs. And it was only with perseverance that people finally made it happen. And I think about that a lot because in some ways we're still very much stuck with our workloads. Um, and it's very hard to switch from one type of hardware to the other. Um, yes, I'm happy to talk about grumpy thoughts about that later as well. But where does that leave us? So. 
We're now in 2012, so everyone switches to deep neural networks. What happens next? So the transformer, what was special about the transformer? Like, why do we talk about it? In some ways, it, it was the accumulation of little insights along the way, but why do people associate this as kind of a, a pivotal moment? Yep, yep, what, so was someone in the back? Self-attention, yep. Parallelism, yes. So you could better take advantage of certain hardware types, yep. Yep. Um, quite it. Vanishing, what, which is related. One of the advantages was avoiding the vanishing gradient. So yeah, you had perhaps more stable training. Um, so transformers were largely all this meant that you could better model longer text. So one of the biggest jumps, I think, was our ability to actually be able to model longer text dependencies. And this meant that overnight, everyone switched again. Um, and I think this was another moment where uh, we're in this other, I would say, plateau where everyone has switched to transformers. I don't think that's necessarily the finish line at all, but we actually just see a lot of architectures now being built on this because we haven't seen a successful deviation from this, although I think that's in very interesting directions. So I would call 2017 to 2023 the great acceleration. Um, what's happened since? Pardon? Okay, Bert came out. What else? DPT. Well, let's not do bingo card for architecture naming. <laughs> so we will run out of bingo cards. What happened? Uh, I guess core fundamentals. What happened? Some people provides learning. Yes, that's true. Yeah, pre-training strategies. Yeah. What else? Pardon? Large-scale pre-training. Excellent. We're going to cover that. Nice. In context learning. Excellent. Yep. Well, successful in context learning, but yes. Efficient fine tuning. Yeah, we'll talk about that. Okay, that's a good number to get us started. Anything else? RLHF. Yeah, we'll talk about that. We'll have some grumpy thoughts about that. That's good. Yes. Anything else? Oh, yeah, you get a bingo card point for that. <laughs> okay, um, so pre-training, yes, as someone mentioned, but pre-training, we, uh, we both, we both uh, found uh, that unsupervised pre-training uh, worked well at creating generalized properties, as well as we just increased the scale of it a lot. So why does pre-training help? Why is this fundamental? Like, why, why do we care so much about that breakthrough? Oh, oh, someone's pointing. You've been sacrificed by your neighbor. <laughs> wow, why does it matter? Why do we care about pre training? Well, it has to be one of you. It's either the neighbor or, you know. <laughs> so, what was that? Oh, wow. You just threw her under the bus and there's no answer. Who wants to jump in? What, why does pre training matter? Yeah, but what is that? I mean, why is that helpful? Yeah, we get a starting point in general. That's a nice prior. So we have this distribution that's a nice prior uh, of like learning um, some form of, what would you call it? What was that? Yeah, initialization, but we're learning general structure, right? Wow, someone said that really fast. They wanted to get it in. <laughs> what was that? Language understanding, yeah, but I, I, I think in some ways the benefit of pre-training in general has been that you learn some general structures. So even though we have a lot of text and it's not very similar or might not be similar to our downstream task, we found by the volume of it, even when paired with an unsupervised kind of weak objective, it tends to learn general structure of the data. So we, we really unlocked impressive improvements in pre-training. Um, oh, let's go this way. Okay, so, um, and then we had changes in the optimization strategy. So previously, the rating paradigm was that you might start with a fine tuned or you might train from scratch, but essentially you're training a model for a task. And so uh, we talk a lot about, you know, essentially having very specialized, a model for sentiment analysis, a model for topic, topic categorization, and all these are fine tuned separately. What changed? Oh, but what, what, what is different about foundation models? 
Yeah, multitask training. So we had that, which is essentially moving from this uh, to training on different tasks at once. So for example, T5 reformulates everything as essentially being the same data set, even though it's very different tasks. And this is actually a non-trivial change because it kind of transitioned us from having this custom view where we have many little models and we kind of silo our data sets to having this wider view that we optimize for everything at once. And that as long as we structure everything in a similar way where we can have an instruction, we can have joint optimization. And this actually benefits from the shared structure. So this um, moves us towards a paradigm where you think about a single model and then adapting that in different ways, but still not in the same way that we did before where we had many different smaller models. Um, and then I, I think one of the big things is the role of data in recent breakthroughs. So what's happened with data? I've hinted at it, so be brave. <laughs> what have we done? What's happened? Oh, internet. So yes, pre-training has benefited from a large volume of data on the internet. So I think that's one thing. So pre-training, the volume has gone bigger. Yeah, what else? Yes, we've actually got, got it more clever about how, we, particularly for pre-training, like a lot of the internet is trash. So we've realized that uh, kind of crude filters matter, even if they're crude. So deduplication, things like this. Tend, deep duplication is actually an interesting open question. It's not clear how much it matters or where, but it is, it's very clear that other filters matter, like removing HTML, trying to strip out different, um, uh, basically all the trash you would imagine on the internet. Weird filters, like restricting yourself to only Reddit threads that have three responses. Uh, there's all these little factoids and papers that are really fascinating that kind of show we're guessing that some things work and benefit. Um, yeah, what else about data? Augmentation, so yes, uh, there has, I would say a lot of the augmentation is not, I mean, people may dispute, but I feel like we've, we've, um, we're continuing to explore with augmentations. A lot of it's been template generation, things like that. How can you pivot things in different ways? But some themes, so we've kind of been, a, because of this move towards a universal model, there's been a renewed interest in the types of data that uh, lend themselves to powerful zero-shot abilities. So performing well on completely unseen tasks. So what do you mean by zero-shot and few-shot? Yeah, yeah, and a few examples. So I give away the zero shot, but good, you got both points, nice. <laughs> um, so it would be example like this. So this is me texting. <laughs> so I said, tell me a, a story about a wizard who goes to a boarding school underwater. And then it does this story about, um, there was a wizard fish called Finnis who was very excited to start his first year at boarding school underwater. So it's kind of concatenating two things. And so there's obviously both these things like wizard school and fishes have a lot of examples, but this interpolation, this perhaps uh, less, less covered space. I think this idea of zero shot is actually, I, I think that we're going to understand more about what is actually zero shot versus uh, what uh, is less zero shot, the more understanding we have the pre-training pre data. Right now, our understanding of pre-training data is actually very opaque. And so the notion of a removed task is a little bit strained right now in the field. But there is no doubt that these models perform well on areas that there would at least be scarce data, that it's not expected there would be much coverage. Um, so, and it turns out two ingredients have been particularly effective for this. So someone mentioned this earlier. So instruction fine tuning, I think this was said at the very first bingo round. Um, so what do we mean by uh, instruction fine tuning or structuring as question answers? So um, we mean you, we often call it prompts and completions, but this idea that you have um, an, a, a kind of question or instruction and then you finish the completion. Um, and so, oh, did something go? Ah, okay, nice. Oh, because I'm never in the screen. Okay, <laughs> that makes sense. I'm going rogue. I'm just roaming in the stage. <laughs> um, okay, so then, oh. I think my clicker might have disconnected. Oh. Ah, okay, I just have to click back here. Oh, yes, okay, it's back. Um, so, uh, and this combination of multitasking and instruction style fine tuning has led to large gains. Um, so we see here that when you actually increase the number of clusters of tasks, you, we see improvements. 
What's interesting is that this has depended on, uh, and this is very helpful for data limited regimes. Why? Why is zero shot really good for data limited regimes? Yes, um, because you know the alternative to uh, zero shot is fine tuning, and so these are the areas where. Uh, data limited regimes struggle to realize gains for fine tuning. We don't have enough data to update the weights. And so this is particularly where we're interested in zero shot settings, because often it's very competitive with what we would get with fine tuning. Typically, the other factor here is the more that you scale, the harder it is to fine tune, fine -tune using limited data. And so there's a tipping point where you scale, where you need more examples in order to update successfully. Um, and also, the more you scale, the more fine tuning can actually be expensive. So this is where it becomes more interesting. Um, and what's interesting is that prompting actually depends on scale as well. So we see these inflection points where prompting becomes effective, but at smaller scales, it's not very effective. And so there's something about the interpolation space of, uh, of larger language models that appears conducive to this type of interpolation and, and unseen examples. Um, I would say this is another area where we just need more work because um, it's probably much more about the optimization factors that we're using than it is about scale alone. But I'll say something grumpy about that later. Um, and then also integrating human feedback about human preferences. So I think someone up there said that, but this idea of uh, reinforcement learning from human feedback. So um, I actually think it's less clear that it has to be reinforcement learning, um, but there's definitely something about using uh, contrastive learning. I suspect we're going to call it more and more, but this idea of how do we structure things as contrastive samples and kind of optimize using that. So where are we? So, oh yes, which one do you prefer? So often when we talk about preference learning, it's structured like this. So you're gonna have some type of, you know, ask a human what they prefer in a ranking. This is also an open question. Do you need to rank four? Do you need to rank two? Do you need to rank four and then add an average score? Everyone's doing it differently. Um, but this question of what inputs you need, as well as how you internalize that as an objective, I suspect will be an active area of work over the next three years. Because I think when you reduce this to what's actually happening, it's not so clear to me that it's RL specifically, but that there may be some more efficient objectives that we'll end up with. Um, so yeah, I, I'm sure many of you will end up <laughs> uh, helping us figure that out. So um, yes, as I mentioned, there's already uh, uh, kind of splintered paradigm about how to actually conduct the optimization. So this was introduced as reinforcement learning human feedback, but actually now there's recent work which shows a few different approaches. So um, in summary, it's been a roller coaster ride. <laughs> so we have um, breakthroughs in a lot of different tasks, um, but we also have a few factors leading to it. What I thought I'd do with actually the rest of the talk today is maybe talk about some areas that I think are interesting, because I know many of you are starting or you're in the middle um, or in your PhD, but a lot of you are starting out. So maybe I'll just say areas that I think uh, you know, I'm currently interested to work on, but then we can open up for questions because that's probably the more fun part where you can tell me what, what what you're curious about right now. So maybe that's what we'll do next. So here's some open challenges I'm currently thinking about. Um, and they won't be the same for everyone. Like I'm sure when Noah <laughs> speaks this week, you'll hear different grumpy problems, but um, <laughs> well, maybe the same. Actually, that's probably good because then uh, ensemble voting, I always say it's nice. Um, the renewed urgency for efficiency. So we have this rapid growth in the size of networks. You kind of have this bigger is better problem. Actually, this this graph is severely outdated. It's I think it's from 2019. So uh, you can trust that it's more like a hockey stick now. Um, <laughs> but we've just seen this massive growth in the size of networks. Um, why? Why? Why do we keep on going bigger? Because it works because it's a painful formula to fight against, excellent. Uh, it's empirically been very productive as a recipe, even though it's been painfully um, frustrating <laughs> uh, because in some ways, I, I think what's interesting is that, oh, and we have this for both vision and LP. So this is just across domains. And as we go into multimodal, we're gonna see it probably tested again. Um, it's, um, I think what's difficult to contest about it is that it empirically is producing interesting results. So deviating takes time and you have to kind of invest in those research directions. 
And what do we mean in empirically results? So some, the, there's some recent work which suggests that it appears to induce emergent properties. I actually think um, we can talk about that. I, I, I think the way that we're measuring some properties, it does appear to, but I actually suspect that we just uh, often don't know how to articulate the optimization conditions to see those properties at a smaller scale. But regardless, what we are seeing is that there are some properties which appear to uh, depend on scale, including, for example, good zero-shot prompting behavior. It appears to depend on a certain scale. Um, but there's a key limitation of this approach, which I think is that we don't actually have a good understanding of what uh, additional parameters gets us. Uh, we don't really know what this relationship is. For example, we have quite a few grumpy points here, <laughs> but one is that there's diminishing returns to adding more weights. So this is actually an old school problem. This is image amp, but the same is true for language. We, um, so you can see this is inception V3 versus V4. So you double the amount of parameters, 21 to 41 per million, but it's only 2% uh, performance gain. So we see after a certain point, even if we double the number of parameters, we're often eking out performance. The other thing is that there's a lot of redundancies between weights. So for those of you who've worked with sparsity or thinking about it, one of the reasons that you can sparsify and remove large amounts of the weights um, is that we can remove quite a lot of weights with surprisingly minimal impact on top line performance, but only after training. And why, why is that interesting? It's because so many of the weights are correlated with each other. So we have so many dependencies. So it's really unclear what additional weights are giving us. Um, there's also this intriguing relationship between weights and data. So who wants to chat about this? You don't have to interpret the charts, but just uh, who would like to say something? What, what, what do we know about the relationship between the amount of data, the amount of weights? Feel free to also guess. Yes, there is something where uh, we have sometimes there's a, the growing con consensus that maybe we've undertrained some larger networks that we could have given more data. And in fact, but there's also this other interesting phenomena where it seems like, oh, actually, go up there. Who? Yeah, that's the one. So there's also this interesting phenomena where we see that. Uh, if we actually focus on more data trained over longer, so we're extending capacity in a different direction where we're adding more data, we can get away with less uh, parameters and it, it's a, equally uh, generalizes in an equally strong fashion. What's interesting is I think there's a third axis, which is quality. So a lot of my research now is on can we actually get away with less data but higher quality and a smaller capacity? Does that absorb the need for the capacity in terms of parameters? I think this is interesting because oftentimes we need parameters to, uh, uh, because we throw so much junk into pre-training data. It's almost like to deal with the regularization factor that the junk in the data gives. So I think that's a underexplored direction right now, but I suspect to see more work on it soon. Um, so yeah, any other thoughts here? Yeah, this is very interesting. I think this is, oh, go ahead. Yeah, this is a good question. So that's actually one of the research directions I find fascinating because there's two aspects, right? How do you estimate quality data? And with that, there's actually two sub questions is that in terms of noisy data, it's easy. Maybe you want to reduce purely stochastic data where, for example, it's um, HTML scripts, things like that. What gets more complicated is if you try and do pruning beyond that. Let's say you want to upweight high quality but you know within a sensible data so it's not trash data it's more challenging data and there's a big like uh i would say point of disagreement over whether you upgrade the harder examples or, or whether you upgrade just the easy examples the, the, there's almost two problems one is data printing in general to eliminate junk but the other is subset selection which is kind of interesting in itself um the second challenge is how do you do it efficiently at scale over massive data sets so what are your proxies for quality? And it turns out once you are talking about such massive pre-trained data sets, you're pretty, yeah, it's pretty narrow what you can do. So yeah, I'm happy to chat about that more later as well. So there's this interesting relationship between weights and data. So it's not clear that we always need more weights. Maybe we can do things in the input space. Um, the other thing is, oh, sorry, this is going. 
Yeah, and then, um, yeah, sparsity uh, can be impressive. So a lot of my work has been on sparsity and you can achieve remarkable gains even if you prune completely randomly. So the random pruning is the yellow and far more sophisticated methods like variational dropout, uh, even simple methods like magnitude pruning, they all do pretty well. Like this is 90, this is close to 99% pruning and it's only there that you see market results. So we, we seem to not need this capacity after we train, but it appears to be crucial for gain to a high dimensional space that performs well. Um, and uh, when we look at what is lost, when we vary the number of weights, it, it, it's, what we find is that most of the weights are used to represent the long tail, the least frequent attributes. And so what this really means, if you think about it, is that we're just using a very expensive methodology to learn the long tail and to navigate rare events. And if you think about that, then the natural conclusion of all our scaling is that this is unsustainable. It's kind of like building a ladder to the moon, because if we're spending so much just to learn the infrequent examples, how are we actually going to navigate uh, the world, which is long tail distribution? Um, Oh, uh, and then I kind of like this recent work. This was led by Arash, who's one of our research scholars. So I mentioned earlier, I don't think there's a consensus about whether emergent properties are inherent to scale. Um, so emergent properties are proposed as these are factors which depend on scale only emerge at large properties. So what Arash showed was that there was this cons consensus that quantization sensitivity was an emergent property, that it was a uh, immutable factor of just scaling that after a certain point, after 6 billion parameters, your model would be far more sensitive to quantization. And what Arash showed along with other collaborators is we showed that you could actually induce optimization properties in the pre-training that remove the sensitivity. So it wasn't scale. It was actually some of the optimization choices that you made, including the whether you use B float or float, um, whether you had certain gradient flow properties. So I think part of what's happening is that we just think scale is so necessary for some of these properties, but in part it's because we're, we've underserved um, a more nuanced understanding of what these weights are gaining us. Like what, what types of pre-training conditioning that can we do that maybe we can approximate this with smaller scale. Um, but uh, as was said uh, earlier, part of why I think we're stuck in this paradigm of just throwing more weights is that the annoyingly simple formula <laughs> to argue against. I feel like we've become like the Moore's law of machine learning, where now we're just stuck on this six month cycle of throwing more weights to the model and seeing if it works. Um, but I think in parallel, there has to be uh, directions which kind of push us out and start questioning exactly what these models and weights are getting us. Um, so all this suggests that scale is a very highly expensive way to achieve these optimization properties. Um, and it's not the only way. We do not have a good understanding. I don't know why I put that in quotes because <laughs> I'm saying it right now. <laughs> I think this is one of those odd slide templates where the quotes are already there. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, I, that's why I think efficiency is very interesting to work on. There's both practical reasons. So how do we make these accessible? But a lot of it for me is also this fundamental question of why do we need to have such big models to begin with? Um, I also think, oh, um, I also think that uh, I always think of a point of comparison. I, our brain is incredibly energy efficient. So our entire brain has over 85 billion euros for ones on the energy equivalent of an electric shaver. But I also think we have key design choices which we don't have in neural networks now. Like we don't do a full forward pass. Unless I do something pronounced like move across the stage, it's very likely that you're simulating what you see. We have optimized pathways for multimodal. So it's very easy for you to walk and talk, but probably not easy for you to walk and read. So different pathways, different combinations of information have different efficiencies, but also we don't absorb all of information. Like we have log scale vision, so we don't have to, uh, we have a natural barrier on how much detail we can absorb. All this means that we have built-in efficiency. Um, we can also squint in if we don't recognize something or follow up and ask a question if we don't understand something. This is a form of adaptive uh, learning, and I think that's also missing. We essentially, for all our models now, we pass everything through the same amount of times. So those are areas that I find very fascinating. How do we do things in a more adaptive way? How do we create priors where we don't have to look at all information? Um, so a lot of my research works on efficiency. So if any of you are interested, happy to chat. Challenge two, and how are we doing for time? Because I want to leave at least 15, 20 minutes for questions. 
I think that's more fun. Ah, okay. So maybe I'll skip this. Well, this one's short, and then I'll see. Yeah, I was about to say if you want to talk to me about reliability, you can talk to me about that too. Um, so three things that I think are important here: hallucinations. Difficulty updating to reflect your information and auditing at scale. Hallucinations, what are they? Pardon? Yeah, made up effect. Are hallucinations always bad? Okay, go ahead. No, why? Creativity, yeah. I think this is an interesting aspect. So we often term it hallucinations when it's bad, but the truth is it's interpolation in space where there's not many examples. So it's not necessarily bad. It's the same thing that makes us think that often brings us joy about interacting with these models. It's the surprise of like seeing the Phineas, the fish at wizard school. Like I think this is a good example, but where we often find people grumpy about it is a break with um, reality. So for example, I asked, my model tell me the biography of Sarah Hooker the ice skater and it's remarkable I'm not I'm kind of a frail person I don't really not definitely not a championship ice skater but it says uh, ice skater who was born on May 10th started skating when she was five years old began competing in local regional youngest skater to win the U.S. biggest skating championship so I assure you this is all not true but this is an example of what we call a hallucination that's perhaps undesirable um so the other is that as soon as the model is trained, it becomes out of date. So if I ask, like, what's the weather in Santa Monica, it could tell me anything, but it's not grounded. It's, you know, the date. So I think these are areas where this is going to be interesting open work. In some ways, the question of hallucination. Oh, go ahead. I was going to ask, do you think the problem is You know, I think that there's far worse. Uh, yeah, if I could think what I'm grumpy about today, I think I'm more grumpy about people. Um, talking about long-term risks and they are willing to acknowledge present day risks. So I choose my battles. I think um, hallucination, I understand it evokes some nature of like human personification, but I feel like that went out the window when everyone started using the term AGI, which for me is far more frustrating. So I just pick my battles, yeah. <laughs> but I think what, uh, what the point is, is that there has been controversy over the term hallucinations that maybe it's too evocative of how human would think um so yeah fair point um yeah i'll leave it to you to decide what battles to navigate and when um so uh and then finally auditing so i won't talk that much about this but i think auditing at scale is a very important open question because now we don't we have data that's too large to human inspect um so using model signal this is work led by shrub uh he's fantastic he led gene uh human sig uh, model signal weekly supervised training signal to distinguish parts of the distribution surface them for inspection, given like a small holdout of just automatically curated subsets. So we called it metadata archeology. span um, This direction is very interesting to me. I, I'm still working on a few different collaborations here. So, um, so yeah, leveraging model data. So the last thing I wanna end with, and maybe I'll go through this more, a little bit more quickly, cause I'd love to leave us plenty of time for questions um, is, Multilingual. I think that this is one of the biggest challenges. Um, I like this quote, the limits of my language means the limits of my world. Um, why is multilingual such a difficult problem? Uh, there's a lot of languages, there's, but it's beyond that. I think we've overfitted to some languages. My mom speaks Gaelic, um, but she says a remarkable number of papers on Gaelic, even though there's very few speakers. So um, there's 0 0.2 uh, papers number of papers oh number of speakers there's 0 0.2 million speakers of gaelic but there's 5235 per million speakers uh, and then you have something like Hausa, which is spoken by 70 million people and you can see the difference so our attention span and what we wait is very um distorted um but also what we've released in terms of progress is also very narrow so even t5 or mt5 which is considered our most breath of languages it's 101 languages um so why why are some languages being left behind in part it's because of our focus on this pre-training data so we've focused on the internet 
the internet reflects early users. So it, this is, um, while only 5% of homes speak English, we have uh, over a half percent of the internet is English and it reflects who used the internet early on. We also see this bias with a lot of other languages where it's disproportionate relative to the number of speakers. Um, and then there's just limited data. So 80% uh, of languages have no text available. And then we have this very skewed representation, but uh, we also just have terrible data quality. What data quality there is uh, typically is very low quality. So this is a fantastic paper by Julia Kritzer and a bunch of collaborators. So 44 of the 65 languages that they audited for quality had misaligned, had over under, contained under 50% correct sentences. So just really poor quality data. Um, and can be difficult to generalize from. So uh, very popular corpuses are available in multiple languages tend to be evangelizing religions, um, which means that there's quite a lot of jargon which is specific to religion. So this was, for example, uh, a lot of uh, the JW300, which was these bunch of magazines that were translated many, many times, but it tends to be very research heavy. I mean, religion heavy, not research heavy. <laughs> um, but also I think, uh, the, there's this coincidence. This is a paper led by Areva, actually, who works with Noah. Um, it's a re I really like this paper. It's talking about the low resource double bind. So it's this co-occurrence of limited compute and also limited data, which makes it very hard for researchers to work on it, but also means if you focus on efficiency, you have these interesting tensions um, where you, you face this low resource double bind. So, um, yeah, what's interesting about this is it's also an opportunity. And so maybe I'll end here. So we're working on this right now because one of the benefits of some of these recent optimization shifts is low data regimes particularly benefit. And so we're working on if we can get some coverage of instruction fine tuning, um, combined with some interesting optimization strategies that we're trying to do kind of unsupervised protocols for some of the languages, um, can we improve this? So um, I'm happy to talk more about that. I think I'll skip this unless there's going to be questions about it. Um, but there's plenty of low-hanging fruit. So I, I think these are a whole list where this is a very underexplored area. Um, and then I'll open up. Oh, yeah, we're running a big open science initiative about it. So feel free to get involved. It's called AYA. Um, we have collaborators from many different institutions. Um, oh, and we called it. So this is why it's AYA, but I'll skip that. I'll, I'll share the slides so you'll have all the slides afterwards if you want to. So where does that leave us? So I think it's an exciting time to do research. I think this is actually kind of, um, whenever there's something which is a shift, it opens up a lot more questions. And I think there's now plenty of questions to tackle. One of which is that um, I think that the world data has again become just to take on renewed importance. There's an important grumpiness to ask, why do we need such big models? I, I, I don't think anyone who's who's serious about their research and has been in this field for a while thinks that transformers is the finish line. Um, I think that the question is, you know, wh what, wh how do we create the space for other research directions and what do we do there? But there's plenty of interesting work there. There's also underexplored directions in the multilingual efficiency space and reliability issues. So yeah, I think these are really, if you're starting out, there's, a, there's many different problems that are tractable. And with that, I will open up for questions. Who has a question? Be brave. Go ahead. Um. Hi, thanks. That was really good. Um, so you mentioned a lot about efficiency and uh, the numerator is normally useful work rather than just work. <laughs> oh, I can repeat the question if that's easier, if it's quicker. Let's see. Does this work? Yeah. Um, I was wondering how sort of trying to interpret what useful work means. I mean, I don't think, I think a lot of what's going on isn't useful in the space of large language models. So I was wondering how your definition of the numerator of the efficiency equation comes into your research or your approach to research? Yeah, I mean, there's a few different ways. I mean, useful and efficiency is particularly, um, 
I would say uh, it's particularly a question mark because people approach efficiency driven by different factors. For example, a lot of people care about real world impact. So when in the publishing uh, area, a lot of people focus on flops or number of parameters. But if you actually deploy models, frankly, flops can be sometimes misleading. Um, you can minimize flops, but change the operation. So you're increasing memory elsewhere. So um, uh, mobile net is a notorious example of this, which was widely adopted, but it actually increases your latency re really weirdly. Um, but, oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, success. <laughs> um, so there's a question metric. I personally think that the role of research at its best is to um, try and balance both. Like for example, when I worked on unstructured sparsity, it's not because it plays with hardware, but I was working on it because I wanted a very precise way to control capacity and ask what you lost when you arrived at a certain number of weights. Um, and I think future hardware will catch up with unstructured sparsity. It doesn't play well now, but it, there's already attempts to make the next generation of hardware. In general, how do I choose what questions are useful? Um, I'm not very driven by soda. I don't think I ever have been. Um, I think it's good uh, to, it's, it can be for those who love it and want to chase that benchmark. I think we're actually in a crisis with soda because we don't have clear benchmarks. So even what it means to achieve that, you know, uh, kind of percentage gain on certain tasks is not clear. Uh, I've always been driven by asking, um, I, I guess, in some ways, this question of why do we need certain things? Like, you know, why do we need so much data? Why do we need such big models? Um, why can't we do adaptive training? Like, for me, that really bothers me that curriculum learning is so bad empirically. I'm like, uh, you know, there has to be some in between. Um, so that, that kind of stuff, yeah, is interesting. Yeah, what else? And maybe I'll shout it out. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, so just for the people on Zoom, so the question was, uh, what are the drawbacks of in-context learning versus fine-tuning? Uh, for me, the big drawback is it's so particular to the architecture. So you see like, people like complain about this, people who are very attached to stable diffusion. If there's a new version of stable diffusion released, you'll see all these people, my prompts don't work anymore. I have to tailor, I have to add in this extra artist and this extra you. And that's because essentially we're poking a high dimensional space, right? And so people get very attached to the prompts that work for that high dimensional space. But if you think about it like that, we're kind of pretty hacky what we're doing, where we're really trying to um, probe, uh, but we're treating it as if it's, um, something which is a miraculous scientific tool. And that's kind of a little bit, I think that's where it's a big drawback. We need better ways to understand how high dimensional spaces translate when you change the model. And, and even for the same architecture, you can end up with very different uh, prompt strategies, which work. Uh, why do I think it's here to stay? It's made models accessible in a way that um, no optimization technique has been able to do before. So that's why, I think that's why fundamentally this moment has been exciting to people and why people who are not even in machine learning have connected so deeply with these models is because unlike computer vision algorithms, which were always kind of behind an application, so you, you may be using a lot of computer vision applications every day, but people didn't connect with them emotionally, I think in part because they couldn't probe them and test them and use them in different ways. And so because it's accessible, it's here to stay, but um, I, as a scientific tool, I'm not a fan. <laughs> um, I think that we'll, we'll have a better understanding over time of how things are generalized. But ultimately, we want tools that generalize beyond a certain of an architecture. And in context learning feels very hacky right now. Yeah, just very high variability. Yeah, what else? Yeah. Uh, oh, I am on. Excellent. Um, I was really pleased to hear you make the comparison with the human brain, um, and especially immediately after oh, we can throw away 90% of the stuff and we don't need to memorize the tale. Well, yeah, I don't memorize the tale of language. I process novel language as a human. That's not me showing off. That's just, yeah. um, what do you think is, uh, do, do you have any thoughts on on kind of which of those optimizations that the human brain has or which of these routes might be applicable for, for models in the sort of short term or medium term, perhaps? Yeah, I think that, so, oh, in terms of the, 
Yeah, so I definitely think we throw out a lot more data. So we're much better able to recall whether we have processed something before. We have much better saliency in general. And not, you know, vision is one example, but even for language, we're, we're much more efficient about how we learn new language. So adaptive training is one. Like, I, I think this idea of uh, having to see the same examples a certain amount of time during training is kind of absurd when you think about it. The main struggle for adaptive training and adaptive network. So adaptive training would be seeing examples different numbers of time depending on the difficulty. Adaptive networks would be growing a network to uh, to a size that's actually optimal given your data. The main struggle for adaptive uh, networks is that we have this matrix vision of how we process data. So it's very hard to have a sparse network that grows. The main obstacle for adaptive training is that um, it requires having a ranking of all the data points at the same time as optimizing. Um, I also think that some efforts to do this, which have not been about reducing the data, but about ordering the data have been painfully unsuccessful. Curriculum learning being the best example. We don't do better than random. So I think there's work to be done there. Uh, in general, what do I think, what do I take away from the brain? I actually think that we do memorize, we just do it way more efficiently. Like if I don't know, if I don't know something or I hate say something I don't understand, I can actually follow up and be like, what do you mean by that? So I can zero in. We have much better ability to focus attention. Um, whereas during training, if you think about it, we just press go and walk away. Yeah, so very interesting. Yeah, what else? Go ahead. Thank you for the presentation. Could you share your opinions or thoughts on how we researchers should evaluate these big creative flexible oh, models? I have to leave that for no. I feel like that's going to be a core piece of his talk. Grumpiness about evaluation. Teaching. Oh, you're teaching. Oh, yeah. Okay. So I'm the one who just gets to throw out opinions. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So um, my thoughts on evaluation, I think that. Um, so evaluation, the reason why it's so strange right now is a few things. So one I mentioned during the talk is this idea of what has the model, what does it not know? So if we train on the internet, even if it's trained in an unsupervised fashion, typically when we talk about test set, it's only with respect to the instruction fine tuning corpus. So, but it's not clear that that was never seen or a similar example was never seen. So that's the first issue. The second issue is that our expectations for what these models have done have just changed so rapidly. Like now I asked, you know, my little research model, what should I do in Lisbon? I then asked it to tell me a story. Like this is, this is so open-ended that the notion of how we evaluate is very strained. Um, I would also say that what we want from these models is often different from what academic benchmarks do. So what we want from these models is verbosity. We want fluency. We wanted to say, sure, let me do that. Like the, it's very odd in some ways, whereas we structure academic benchmarks to be a lot about uh, precisely relaying a very succinct piece of information. And so for all these reasons, we're evaluating on things that in practice, people still would prefer a model that's fluent and uh, has this natural feel, even if it did terrible on the, all these academic benchmarks. And that really highlights the tension. Yeah, that's a good question. Go ahead. Oh, yes. Yeah, so the question for those on Zoom was um, this idea of using models to evaluate other models. This has come up most uh, frequently with like uh, using GPT-4 to evaluate other models, using the ELO score, basically uh, amplifying that. Um, yeah, I think it's I think it's really strange. I think that what 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 typically you see in terms of bias is that it it biases towards text that's similar to GPT-4. So within the family, if you have a benchmark uh, like a GPT family, it's gonna have higher scores than if you do something totally different as an architecture. So what that means is that we're not getting great diversity. We're skewing heavily towards the type of text produced by GPT-4. Um, yeah, there's a whole bunch with benchmarking there that's difficult. I think, I don't know. I feel like um, even the idea of annotator pools since everyone's using different annotator pools, it's really strange to compare there, even if you're not using automatic score. But anyways, that's more, yeah. But basically, yes, it's a big problem. It, it means that our diversity in terms of generation is, 
being dampened because implicitly we're biasing for the same type of text as GPT-4. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, who wants to take that on? Yeah. <laughs> Um, I mean, I think it's an open question. I, I think that there's no denying the empirical evidence that it appears that these models have statistically learned valuable mappings. So um, the question is, um, I would say the, the question, I think underlying your, your premise is, is this understanding, is this true notion of what language means? I think I, I go back and forth between whether that's a useful question. And I'll say more. What I mean by that is that ultimately how you feel about these models is depends on your feelings towards how they're communicating. We can benchmark many of these properties and most benchmarks, depending on which ones you choose, may tell slightly different stories. But I think most people interacting with these models do feel like it's persuasive communication. Um, and so while I think the details of what properties it's able to capture versus not, uh, the objective has been surprisingly resilient to importing large grain structures. Yeah, does anyone want to do a grumpy counterpoint? I think we have, go for it. No, no is, <laughs> yeah, but this is an active question in the field. I think that, um, I just don't know if it's the question to focus on. And maybe by that, I mean, I don't think there's a single definition of what it means to have understanding or what it means to learn a language. I think in many ways that's ambiguous as well. For the same reason that I get frustrated at the question about AGI, I think that this question of understanding has become much more value-driven question than it has been about a scientific, one specific scientific metric. Because basically, depending on your metric, you can paint either picture right now. And so it's interesting to think about that. Yeah, go, oh, oh. Did it know give a thumbs up? Okay, nice. Nice. If there's another, if someone's grumpy about this though, someone should speak the counterpoint and argue for it. So um, what else? Uh, I think there's a gentleman who hasn't spoken. Yeah, go uh, ahead. Uh, my question is regarding the training time complexity. How can we actually deal with this problem? And uh, since basically data is increasing, also the model size is increasing as well. So I'm expecting that the training time is a big issue. Uh, what is your solution for it? And uh, uh, what is actually the relationship between, uh, for example, the, the, the training time and, for example, the batch size, for example? The batch size? Yeah. Oh, um, so the batch size depends a lot on your memory within your uh, available hardware. So it depends on also if you've done distribution or not. So whether your model is big enough, it's distributed over multiple hardware devices. So batch size. So obviously batch size is related to training time by the time it takes to get through an entire data set, an epoch. So up until now, we've kind of been stuck in this paradigm of a single epoch because these data sets are so large, but some people have pushed that out and shown, I think quite intuitively that uh, more epochs benefit. So when, you know, seeing the same example multiple times is beneficial. The constraint has been the amount of data. So you're right. Um, I think that's one of the reasons I'm interested in data pruning, which is if you can rely, get to a more tractable subset, you can train for longer. Um, uh, and perhaps you can use a smaller model. That's another question. But you can definitely maybe go for longer and, and maybe see the same data point multiple times. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, does that kind of answer your question? So data pruning is one. Better distribution strategies is another. So. Um, yeah, go ahead. Can we also say that uh, more number of parameters lead to uh, more training time? Um, so will more number of parameters be more training time? So it does take longer to do a forward pass through the model if it's larger. Um, but the biggest denominator in training time is the amount of data. So it's just, uh, it, especially if your model is large, you have to do distributed. So that also adds the training time because typically you need the accumulation of grading, gradients and that's an operation that has latency, but it's 
the main factors are not just the number of weights, it's also the amount of data. So these all play together. It's very, they're not isolated. Yeah, what else? Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, more work is going to come out, which is trying to explicitly train multimodal. I think the lack of consensus right now is what are the right objectives and what's the right structure? Is it like a jigsaw puzzle where you train it and then it's kind of stick it together, which is the latter? Um, I don't have an opinion. I, I think that um, it's very intuitive to me that that's the way we're going with multimodal, because in some ways, our senses are very, uh, we benefit from many senses, not just vision language, uh, audio, but also I think one of our biggest ones is actually motion, the ability to perturb space, move forward in space, like hear closer, see, jitter, our environment. We're not capturing that with multimodal, but I do think this is the direction we'll naturally go in. I suspect, unfortunately, the biggest First step is people just trying to scale existing architectures and patch them together. Um, I, I think that a lot of our breakthroughs are going to be hacky to begin with. There's also an interesting question with multimodal about the objective, like what, what should the structure of inputs be? Do you want to always, you know, stable diffusion is, you know, input language, output image, but you can imagine a combination where you might want to input uh, different modalities in your input and then have some different, I think there's a lot of experimentation around that. Yeah. So, yeah, so, so uh, go ahead. Yeah, so like there's a lot of devices, there's like the lens of the way the API or like the model phone would come back like this. Oh, bringing it back. <laughs> yeah, go for it. Um, so maybe I'll share why I'm grumpy about the term API. So, AGI kind of infers as a single finish line. So it's kind of like, oh, hit it, checkbox. But the truth is um, this notion of what it means to be competitive with humans is there's no such binary checklist, right? So there's many, first of all, we have many different distribution of intelligence. But secondly, there's already some tasks that apparatus is very good at, like calculators, that they're much better than humans. So this notion of what is when do we say we're you know it's achieved AGI is is very imprecise to me and much more value driven because in some ways these models are already better than us at some things right so computer vision applied to uh, medical images is far better than humans maybe mainly because we have log scale vision we can't pick up very subtle differences between pixels these models can but that hasn't troubled anyone because doctors have largely not adopted them. It's, you know, it's certainly not replaced doctors. So the question about how you feel about the technology feels as important to me. When we talk about AGI, I often find it's become a proxy for like how you feel about the technology, which is something that, yes, as a society, we should discuss, but I don't think it's necessarily something as scientists we need to always discuss. Um, but yeah, what do you think? Yeah, like uh, continuing on this, so like, oh, okay, uh, go for it. <laughs> uh, like, of existential risk of yeah, yeah, so like, how uh, is yeah, um, so existential risk is a painfully imprecise argument because it depicts it as this one moment in the future where there'll be a sudden jump in risk that literally threatens humanity. So that's the definition that people are using of existential risk. So firstly, I think that if we're going to take that framework seriously, we have to have some estimate of what we mean by that time in the future. Humans are notoriously bad at predicting long-term events. Like that's why we find it so hard to like choose a partner or choose a job even though it's pretty easy to decide to like walk to a cafeteria because there's a schedule. So our ability to estimate, you know, what is this point in the future is then compounded by the fact that most people who focus on existential risk say that it's a, a kind of emergent ability that we don't yet know. And so for me, this is, it displaces an accountable conversation because the truth is there's a lot of risks these models right now. So. Uh, both in terms of how they'll be used as well as expectations about use. And so for me, if we're going to talk about risk, it makes sense to talk about present risk and extrapolate from there. 
even if it's poor, but this, this desire to focus so much on a future event, which is undetermined, but which will emerge, it feels like, frankly, maybe this is where I say we stopped the YouTube stream, but it does feel like a little bit like um, the 2000s, where it's like, oh, at midnight, this is going to happen. But what's frustrating about it is we don't even have an end date to this because there's no nothing specified. So it's just this unaccountable conversation that's propagated. So for me, it's technically imprecise. Yeah. What do you think? Uh, first, I, I think uh, like are uh, not the only way towards intelligence, but uh, the concept of risk is definitely something to consider as the models are more yeah and so for um so for the people on youtube i think what the gentleman's saying is that there is this notion of amplified risk which i don't think anyone dispute, disputes my uh frustration is this idea of unaccountable future risk rather us talking about what is amplification of risk today yeah so i think we may be out of time how are we doing andre I think we have time for uh, one more. I'm going oh, to ask that excellent. one. Excellent. Perfect. And, and Perfect. then see if there is. A... Yeah, maybe one more. So I, I just have one question. Ah. I want to go back to the energy efficiency stuff. <laughs> Please go uh, ahead. Uh, no, there's time for one more after this one. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so you, you, you mentioned that, uh, uh, you know, the human brain is, is orders of magnitude more efficient than our current AI systems, which is true. Uh, and some of the ways you are trying to make uh, things more efficient is by, you know, weight pruning, mixtures of experts, you mm -hmm. know, this, this stuff. But you are not uh, changing fundamentally the hardware. And a big difference that uh, exists in the human brain is that communication is asynchronous, while in neural networks everything goes uh, synchronously. So you don't have spikes, uh, you know, in the, in the, in the current artificial neural networks. Uh, but there's a lot of work in uh, neuromorphic, neuromorphic computation and this kind of stuff. Do you do you believe that you can actually get close to uh, energy efficiency efficiency at the level of human brain without fundamentally changing the hardware? What are our thoughts on that? Yeah, I like this question because Andrea is actually reminding me of a grumpy thing I should have said, which is the other inefficient thing we do is global updates, right? So this is the issue where we do global updates, so we don't have modularity or we don't have the ability to learn things at different rates or do partial updates. It also is what's related to this catastrophic forgetting. So we keep on erasing, we can't retain information. Um, yeah, I think areas around uh, non-global updates, having modularity in general in networks is super interesting. Um, do I think analog computers are the way to go? I think I would not send someone to be a sacrificial lamb for that right now, but I would say, we need more hardware diversity in general. Global updates, the, the issue is twofold. So one is, yes, the hardware matters, like how we are able to structure um, even things like, you know, growing networks or networks that our own neurons form over time and based on the strength, we adapt. So adaptive networks in that sense, uh, we aren't able to do with current hardware. But it's also uh, just we need ways to um, I frankly think that part of the issue why we haven't been able to get away from global updates is that we found that these weights which receive uh, global updates, even if we impose constraints for modularity, haven't been very successful the current approaches. And so I think things like uh, one thing I did enjoy about Jeff Hinton's ACL lecture was the specific mentoring and things like weight sharing. So having um, signal between networks that can be leveraged over time to have um, local representations that form global learning um, in a way that doesn't require these global updates. I mean, one of the things I find interesting about human intelligence is that our intelligence is not, um, it, it's not, we often perceive a human as intelligent, but our intelligence is very collective and it's very based on our desire to gain the respect of each other, if you think about it. You know, we kind of uh, uh, all show up at the same time places and all sit down. And even this format of me teaching you and, and uh, everyone sitting down is very particular to our protocols and societal kind of accepted behavior that makes our intelligence so powerful. It's why we're able to align and kind of work on things at the same time. So this is local, but we have these global communication that allows for coordination. So this is really interesting. Yeah, what do you think? 
No, I, I, I don't know. This is a, I, I think that uh, eventually we need to do something that uh, fundamentally changes uh, this architecture, but I think it will take, uh, you know, uh, too, too long to, to get yeah. there. So and, until that happens, uh, there's still room of improvement. Yeah. Uh, with with current architectures, but it's limited. I think uh, you know the yeah. synchronous the synchronous uh, uh, difference is quite substantial. I actually agree with that. Yeah, I think that the fact that transform is now the building block for anything, everything is it puts us in this kind of uh, friction place where we end up overfitting to certain choices. So, yeah, I think one more question, and then we should go for dinner. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, do you want to respond to this one? Ah, I will repeat the question. So I heard keywords, I heard quantum computing, I heard stochasticity, and I heard So what I heard a lot about was uh, the language understanding. And from that, I wanted to, to grab the stochastic part uh, issue. And the idea that the classical uh, hardware that we use today isn't enough to, to solve this problem. So, And I have been at least uh, hearing a lot about the evolution of quantum computing to the future. Do you think that the, the future lies there or is? Uh, yeah, I mean, I know nothing about quantum computing. <laughs> <laughs> um, who knows who's an expert, a dual expert in quantum computing and deep learning and can answer this question? Put your hand up. Oh, I'll have to be at the next summer school. <laughs> yeah, but I, I think in general, um, yeah, I don't have an answer, but I think that's good because otherwise I would say an answer that probably wouldn't be correct. So <laughs> yeah, thank you, everyone.